So I had to figure out something to do with a lot of clips that I haven't used. So I made that little stitched together Doomer-esque developer video. Now, do I believe that the job market is that bad? No, it's not that bad. It is not the greatest, but I wanted to make something unique and interesting. So I want to take that and then talk about security <laughs> because security um, is difficult. And when you are reviewing a pull request, it can be hard to figure out things to look for, which we talked about in a previous video of just like a starter set of things that you should just be on the lookout for generally um, as you're kind of getting more familiar and comfortable doing pull requests. But another aspect to that is security. And it, obviously this heavily is dependent on what type of programming you are doing. Obviously, if you are working with embedded systems, it's going to be a little bit different than if you're working with web technologies. So in the context of this video, I'm going to be talking about .NET and web technologies. So any kind of front end, back end development that interacts with client or a database or a server or anything like that. So when you're looking at a pull request and you're thinking about, is this code secure? You're going to be want to be you're going to want to be thinking about is the connection to the database itself secure? You're going to want to avoid any kind of hard coded credentials, any kind of hard coded connection strings that may contain a, a username, password, a secret, whatever it is. You're going to want to avoid that. You're going to want to have that injected somewhere else, either from a third party service through GitHub or something similar. There's a, there's a number of different ways to do it. If you are if you use AWS, you can use um, <clears throat> Param Store, Secret, uh, what is it called again? Secret Store, something like that. Azure has its equivalent. There's, there's a bunch of different things you can use, but you're gonna wanna make sure you avoid any hard-coded credentials in your code. So just one thing to look for. But as you connect to the database, once the connection is established, However you are constructing that client, however you are constructing the SQL to be executed against the database, you're going to want to make sure that there's no possibility that you can that the user could inject SQL into that query. This is a SQL injection attack. It's very common and it's easily avoided if you structure and set up your code correctly. So there's different sanitizing methods you can do. If you use link, there's um, ways you can do that, especially if you're using raw SQL. If you're using something like a like a different ORM, like Dapper, um, you can use a parameterized structured SQL to avoid this. What you don't want to do is you don't want to just say, you don't want to just make your SQL a string with a variable in there that is passed in from, from a user editable field or anywhere that is being sent over the network because anything that's sent over the network can be manipulated. And if somebody manipulates that to some, be some kind of bad, you know, exploitative SQL that can then be passed in, then, then you run into an issue. So you do not want to just pass that variable in the string. You want to make sure that you're passing it as a parameter, however the ORM treats that. So it's very important that that's set up correctly. So whenever you're dealing with SQL, connection to the database, just be on the lookout for those things and just be mindful of the possibility of, you know, how this may be exploited by somebody with bad intentions. And that's how we have to be thinking about as software developers because we're trying to write secure code. So we have to be thinking about sometimes worst case scenario in terms of is this safe is and is it secure? Another thing that we should be mindful of uh, is how we're constructing the actual HTTP client. Are we newing up a new instance of it every time? And if we're newing up a new instance every time, we may actually create too many connections to the database itself, which may overload the database, which in itself may pose a security risk. And not in the sense that uh, somebody could gain access, but in the sense that the database could go down, which could pose other security risks. So you want to be mindful of how many connections to the database are you establishing and are you making sure that the connections are uh, uh, basically authenticated right and it, once they're authenticated is the user authorized 
to access whatever table they need, they need to. So you want to make sure you have authentication obviously set up, authorization set up, and you want to make sure that the connections are limited either by way of connection pooling or some kind of just uh, just finite number of connections. But obviously connection pooling is probably what you're going to go with, which you may need to check on the database side to make sure that that is enabled. And then when you set it up in .NET, you can, you can set that up for um, connection pooling. Another thing to think about in terms of security is that you may need to limit uh, read and write access depending on the query being executed. So if you, if you are doing a select, you may want to just limit that to a read only instance of the database if it's available. Now, I'm not saying that this you need to, but it might just be good practice to do that for security reasons, just to limit, you know, just to keep base level permissions and then elevate those privileges as, as you need. Just So when, whenever you are writing a select, if you have a read-only instance available to you and you know you're not going to be writing to it, you probably should opt to use the read-only instance or the instance with the least or the instance or the connection sharing the least amount of privileges exposed to whatever that whoever that user is um, on the front end side of this whenever you are dealing with editable text in a form uh, in some kind of input box so anything that's being submitted over the network to the back end needs to have restrictions on it you need to have set up, especially in .NET, you can set up annotations on the model that, that are bound to the uh, input field to set the, the max character uh, length, the string length, the type of data that's accepted in the field, uh, whether or not the field you know, is a valid email. There's a million different things you can set, but you want to make sure you have some kind of checking on the model and also that the model state is valid before we send it off to wherever we're sending it off. So you want to have some limitations and a big one that you want to make sure is that you can't just spam whatever button you're pressing. So some people, you know, you may see like code that is activated on button enter or button down. Well, what happens if you just hold enter? Are you going to overflow the system? And sometimes that can lead to very unintended consequences and you may actually get um, an overflow from the server containing information that you didn't expect and that may be sensitive. So you want to make sure that if you are dealing with buttons, you want to make sure that it's either on button up, so when the button's released, or you want to have some kind of other limitation that restricts how many times the user can either submit a form, click enter, or whatever else. So it's very important that that is set up and it's an easy thing to check for. So if you ever are looking at front end, just be mindful of those things and just be mindful of, hey, can this be, you know, can somebody just spam a button and will it lead to bad results? You don't want that. So just be thinking about that when you're looking at pull requests and be thinking about that also when it comes to the back end. Uh, when, when we do send a request from the front end to over the network to the back end, the server, what, how is the endpoint treating that data, right? We already talked about annotations that can be placed on the model properties, but is there anything additional that we need? Do we need to actually add explicit checks in the controller or the service to validate against any uh, blank input, any, uh, any text that doesn't match what we're, what we're trying to do? You can accomplish this with some kind of regex pattern. You can accomplish this with a number of different ways, but you want to make sure that by the time that data that's inputted is sent to wherever it's sent, either posted somewhere, uh, included in a SQL query, you want to make sure that it's sanitized to the best way to to the best that you can do. And sanitized basically means it's it's going to be stripped of any kind of like uh, you know you may see like escape characters. It's going to be stripped of any kind of mal. Uh, you know, anything that has any kind of malintent shouldn't be included in that. And obviously it's difficult. Um, and over the years, uh, you know, there have been a number of uh, things added to like the, uh, the the CWEs. What is it? Common weakness enumerations. Uh, those are just a collection of like the most dangerous software 
exploits that have been found over the years. There's other ones included in, in OWASP and other things like that. Just be mindful of those those lists of like what are the most popular exploits that have been found and just see what are the, the mitigations that you can do in, uh, in whatever framework you're using. So .NET, um, you'll see a lot of resources on .NET. You'll see a number of other things, but it's just be it's just good practice to be thinking about what are the known limitations, what are the known vulnerabilities, and can we avoid that? .NET provides you a lot of flexibility in terms of being able to add additional security headers in the code. Um, one of them, actually, that you can do is to not uh, include what version of .NET the server is running with. Uh, it's possible to see on, on certain systems what version is being used, and so .NET includes, I don't know if they include it by default anymore, but there is a way to not disclose what version of .NET or .NET Core you're running, which is which is helpful because if you're, you know, it's, it's I, I think it's included in, man, I forget what guide shows you what security headers .NET recommends you including in your code, but it's good practice to be thinking about that. So if, when you're examining a pull request, you should be looking at those things. You should be mindful of, can we make this more secure? And if we can, is it appropriate to do it in this pull request or should we raise another pull request to do that? So anyway, this is just a really, really baseline start of some basic things that you can be looking out for. There's a million different other things you can be looking out for, but hopefully this acts as a, just to start the conversation around security and pull requests. So thank you all for watching. I'll see you in the next one.